welcome. <laughs> the wonderful classroom we've got here. I imagine it probably seats 150. So we have 26 or so in the class. And so I think it's a six to one seating thing. Looks like it, one, two, three, four. There's four between people. So it's probably um, 125 capacity uh, lecture hall compared to 325, which was our 10 sparks. If any of you took, some of you certainly took 303 and suffered through 303 with me. I made you suffer through 303. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we're nicely uh, distanced. It's a nice uh, place to be. Um, there was a deliverable, I guess, on Sunday. I think it wasn't quite set up with a Dropbox, although one person at least was able to drop off a, a PowerPoint file, even though it wasn't quite set up absolutely properly. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm not super worried about this. My, my intent on getting you to submit an outline is to get you to think about what you're going to do and do it in advance instead of doing it all um, the night before, basically. And so uh, certainly there's a Dropbox there. Uh, some, sometime tomorrow, I'll go through the stuff that's been there and give you some feedback. Uh, I think it'll be very cursory. Um, I think uh, I can't easily do it now, but I think if you look at the um, the syllabus, it'll tell you when your next deliverable is due. My guess is that you need to upload a full PowerPoint presentation in two weeks time from this past um, Sunday midnight is, is my guess. I'm, I'm doing that from memory. You, uh, yeah, I feel completely out of it, but I can't do all of these uh, interesting things. So I have your stuff uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, start thinking about what you're putting together. I did see the one PowerPoint that someone has uploaded was already in you know, 15 pages with a title on each page. And that's just perfect. That's the way to, to work and to, to start filling stuff in uh, as you go along. Um, so, that's it. So, so I guess the point is uh, begin presentation stuff now. There is no, um, some of you asked whether it's okay to change topics. Yes, it is. Um, I was interested in Justin's talk on um, last Thursday uh, to find out that clearly a lot of you are interested in because the jobs are there in uh, direct uh, direct use and heat pumps, I, I guess. Uh, and so that kind of explains that to me. It was that people were grouped in certain areas. Um, that's actually not what I do at all. <laughs> Uh, but I think that is, in terms of this course, probably where the jobs are. The jobs in high temperature geothermal are, are there because uh, you'll talk to some people who've worked in that area, but they're certainly not as plentiful as the more uh, routine jobs that are available in, in heat pumps. So start on your presentations. Change your topic if you want. It's not a big deal to me. Um, and the other thing that, uh, so ultimately, you can look at the progression. It's on the, either on the back of the syllabus, the third page of the syllabus of uh, the delivery dates, or it's a separate page. I can't remember which. Um, the kind of outline areas are okay to, to veer away from that. What I am going to get you to do is to make a quiz of 10 questions, multiple choice questions, so that everyone will view all of these videos. I guess you'll have your answers to your own quiz, so it's be kind of pointless. But you can, so you can get 100% at least on that one. I think I will also uh, ask everyone to rank the other presentations apart from themselves. So rank them between first and 24th, and then supply me with that information, just because I'm interested to see it. I, I will grade them in some form. It won't be from 100% to zero, uh, as that would suggest. But I would kind of be interested to hear your concurrence on what you think are actually um, good presentations and which are are not quite hitting the mark. The um, presentations you're looking at already, uh, the one that wasn't available, I gave everyone 100 points for uh, after someone mentioned that wasn't available. If that happens again, then I'll do the same. All it is is that someone uploaded something to their own uh, YouTube and they've taken it down. And so it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and you'll see, I, I haven't looked at those presentations lately, but I, I recall from two years ago when this class was offered and we had 11 students and they did two presentations each that they vary quite broadly in terms of what they what they were. And so that may well be the case this time. And so I'd be interested to, for you to, to give feedback yourselves on that. I think you're perfectly capable of doing that, obviously. And obviously, you should do it ethically to not 
you certainly won't grade your own and so or rank your own and so it's, a, it's just a, an interesting exercise and it would inform me i guess is, is what i use it for uh what else Any, anything else we need to take care of uh, for the good of the order um it's a pretty lightly graded class i guess is probably the terminology that's appropriate for this i'm just finding my way through it last time we've given this class once and it was kind of a self-run class so this is the first time where i'm actually putting some effort uh, into it to pull things together. All right. Hearing nothing else, I will start talking. Anything going on, else going on? Okay. All right, uh, recap. Well, I can't uh, overwrite anything, I don't think. Um, I guess, yeah, no, don't move it up yet. Um, I'm trying to think. So recap. So what we've talked about so far, uh, we've talked about Darcy's law um, and that allows us to be able to say something about the rates at which fluids are transmitted through a reservoir. Um, we talked about Darcy's law in terms of both heads and pressures and the different ways that we can write Darcy's law and we talked about the swimming pool effect. Uh, typically in this class we'll use pressures because we're working at relatively high temperature and relatively high pressure in, in many cases. Um, and so we'll build a little bit on that. We also uh, talked about flow nets, in which case we can look at the geometric effects of flow within a field. And I was going to do an example. Clearly, it's not going to be today uh, on that for some of the stuff that Justin came up with for um, uh, Rotokawa, which is uh, the field in New Zealand at, in Rotorua. Uh, but we won't do that today. Um, I'm not sure whether we made the point, but yeah, we did talk about uh, relative permeabilities. So we made the point that reservoirs can exist with fluids in them, and those fluids can be liquids or vapors, uh, depending, and they can coexist. And depending on the proportions in which they coexist, then the transmission characteristics of each of those fluids can be kind of centrifuged into two different fluids, in which case we need the idea of relative permeability. And that the geometry of flow matters. So Darcy's law applies to kind of a core. And if we want to apply it to say a well doublet, then we have to accommodate that. And actually we can do that with uh, flow nets. It's relatively simple, but it's a relatively powerful technique uh, that we can use. Uh, didn't come up with any movies, hence the question marks. Uh, the mass and energy balance is one of our 303 YouTubes from conservation of mass, um, and uh, which this kind of background to stuff that we'll do that. Uh, can you move down to motivation and a bit further? Is, it, is it Andrew I'm talking to? Can, am I yes. Able, yes, am I I'm able, here. Actually, am I able to move? Can you move down? Uh, yes, uh, I can. Motivation right at the top and to keep on going. Yeah, we've seen the figure with the gradients of uh, temperatures and going from left to right on that four part uh, figure from hydrothermal ones, plate boundaries, to reservoirs we want to create anywhere under New York City. And if you now go up to the text below that, I guess the questions that we want to address are, uh, what pressure and temperature changes uh, do we see in a reservoir during production? How do these rates impact how long and at what temperature we can produce fluids from the reservoir? Just because we can produce fluids, it doesn't necessarily mean that we'll produce hot fluids. And so we need to be able to figure that out. And we can describe some simple models that allow us to address those systems. Uh, so the, the flow part uh, is composed of steady state flow using Darcy's law, which we did last time. Uh, but we can also release fluid from storage. Uh, so in other words, just like um, a brake caliper, when you stand on a brake caliper and pressurize it, the fluid gets pressurized and the volume of the caliper reduces. And so we can think about that. Uh, if there was a hole in the caliper, it would squeeze the fluid out. And that's the, the change in pressure that we can develop from the system. And what we will do, and I'm sure we won't get beyond today, is first of all, we look at a kind of lump parameter system. And lump parameter systems are where we look at conservation of mass and energy. Uh, but we don't look at the spatial gradient term, the dp dx or d2p dx squared terms. We throw away Darcy's law in those particular cases. 
And so we make the distinction between box models where we have inputs into a bucket and inputs from outputs from a bucket and distributed parameter systems where we actually account for the distribution of fluid pressures across the bucket, I guess is uh, the difference from that. Okay, can you wind it down a little bit, please, Andrew? Scientific questions. So there are five topics that we maybe will talk about. Um, overhaul behavior of geothermal reservoirs under production, how they get depleted, uh, simple lump parameter models uh, to describe that behavior. And that's, I'm guessing, as far as we'll get today, uh, distributed parameter models and thermal breakthrough and limits of heat rate recovery are all important because the first two really talk about whether we can create fluid from the reservoirs, but there's no guarantee that that fluid, if we're introducing it at one location as cold fluid, it flows across the reservoir and is recovered. There's no guarantee that it uh, will come out as being hot fluid. And so we know from the expression for power from these reservoirs, which is mass rate of flow, the product of mass rate of flow, um, specific heat capacity, lowercase c, and delta t, change in temperature, that we need all three of those to be big for the power to be large that comes out of it. If we have a big fluid flow rate, but the water goes in cold and comes out cold, then it's not producing any useful uh, work for us uh, in the recovery fluid. And so the first two, I suppose, are looking the flow rates out, and the last three are looking at whether we can guarantee that if we're injecting fluid, re-injecting fluid that we've taken the heat out of, maybe down to 50 degrees centigrade, re-injecting it to the reservoir to keep it um, inflated and saturated, allowing it to go across the reservoir and taking it out, it has to have a long enough residence time to be able to pick up heat. Okay, let's go down. All right, so what these reservoirs look like. Um, we've talked about the form of these reservoirs. The picture on the right, I guess, is really uh, what a hydrothermal reservoir looks like. Um, different from the EGS ones, which are what we perhaps like to be able to do in every place on the continent. And the idea is that you get recharge of cold water from the side, it sinks, uh, it gets heated by the heat at depth, and uh, it is made more buoyant and it rises. And so you get this convection cell that develops. Uh, if you have a low permeability cap, it potentially traps in uh, the pressures uh, because it won't allow fluid to escape across that cap. And uh, if it allows the pressures to increase, then it can stay as a liquid, uh, even at relatively high temperatures. And so we have to understand uh, the pressure and temperature that's present within the, the system. If you go down uh, another slide, uh, another, yep, yep. And so these are from Glassley's book. And so the stuff today, uh, yeah, I think it is from Glassley's book. These are from Glassley's book. And you might recognize that these are depth pressure relationships. I didn't uh, mark them off to see exactly what the fluids are. So you know that if it's a swimming pool, that the pressure will increase at the unit weight of the fluid. My guess is that even though Wairaki, uh, the second ever developed geothermal reservoir in the world, geothermal field in the world, although it's a vapor dominated reservoir, my guess is that that uh, pressure versus depth relationship is one for liquid water within the system. Certainly on the right-hand side, uh, these reservoirs mean, the names mean nothing to me, but the fact that the, um, the gradients of pressure with depth are almost vertical suggests that they're vapor, right? It's, it's the difference between the unit weights of water and the unit weights of vapor. Uh, vapor would be pretty close to air and they're roughly a, a thousand fold different, one kilogram per cubic meter versus a thousand kilograms. And so the form of the pressure distribution with depth in the reservoir tells us something about what's going on. And of course, reservoirs that have, uh, you see on the top right figure, the hydrostatic, the gradient of that curve would be um, one over the unit weight of liquid water. Now, a thousand, not a thousand kilograms per cubic uh, per meter, but 10,000 kilonewtons, right? The product of density, times gravity, which gives us a uh, unit weight. And the lithostat, the gradient of that, instead of being 10 kilonewtons per meter, would be 27 kilonewtons 
pyramid. It's the weight of rock above this. And uh, I'm pretty sure that the vertical bars on that would be just um, vapor. One or two or three kilograms per cubic meter. Not very much. Okay, down, please. All right. So this is the the kind of system that we're dealing with. On in the middle panel, you see pressure and temperatures and how they originally vary with depth. Um, what we're going to do is we will decrease the pressure because we need to decrease the pressure to allow uh, water to flow to the well. That is typically done in a configuration like the left-hand side where we're producing a part of the reservoir. So pressure will be dropped in the production area and pressure may be increased in the injection area. We need to do both because if we just produce, we potentially deplete the reserve and we don't renew it. Um, and we don't have the heat transfer medium, the water to be able to be uh, saturated in the reservoir. So by producing and injecting, we set up a gradient of pressure across the reservoir high pressure on the left, low pressure on the right. And also, since we're injecting water, which isn't um, 200 degrees centigrade, probably it's 50 degrees centigrade, because we've taken as much of the useful energy out of it. If you look at the temperature profile across the system, then you'll have cold in the left-hand side and hot still on the right, you hope, because if you're producing cold water, it's not a geothermal field. And you want the supply of heat from below by conduction to be large enough to be able to make sure that that vertical front that you see here doesn't work its way all over to the production well, because that means you get, you're get you producing cold water. And you can do that by two things, I suppose. Producing, uh, allowing hot water to come from the rest of the reservoir driven by this drop in pressure, which is fine. Or having a long enough residence time for the cold water in the system such that you uh, allow it to gain heat from the rock by conduction before you produce it. So physically what we're doing at the production well is we're dropping the pressure and uh, potentially we're dropping the temperature. Uh, intrinsically what that will do is it will make a difference in the composition of the reservoir. And it's something that starts off having a high enough pressure to be liquid but with steam sitting above it because it isn't high enough pressure. As you drop the pressure, this will become um, steam, but maybe liquid dominated steam. And this will become steam, but maybe vapor dominated steam, just because the pressure here is, is now insufficient to be able to keep much water in, in solution. Uh, and the liquid part of the reservoir is diminished below. So this quartet, I guess, of figures, so these two, four, four different components, essentially says what we're attempting to do. Okay, Andrew, can you go down? All right, lump parameter models. Okay, yeah, that's great. Perfect size. What do I want to say? Okay, so we talked about uh, enthalpy. We know that enthalpy per unit mass is this term H, which is equal to the internal energy per unit mass uh, plus the pressure. So there's two components of, of uh, enthalpy. And those are the internal heat part, which is the U part, and the internal pressure. And we have both of those in the reservoir, as we saw on the previous uh, slide. And we can have a look at exactly what each one of those amounts to. And so if you imagine producing a reservoir, say at 200 degrees centigrade, and re-injecting at 100, uh, 100 degrees centigrade is a, is a good number. A typical pressure drop within a reservoir might be a thousand meters of water. Say. So you might be a thousand meters deep and certainly the biggest pressure drop you can get from that existing hydrostat at a thousand meters depth would be to have atmospheric pressure at your production well. And so the maximum pressure drop you could get would be of the order of a thousand meters of water. And if you work out what that is, it's roughly 10 megapascals. 10 kilonewtons per meter multiplied by 1,000 meters. So that's where the, uh, this, this number comes from. So what you can do is you can look at the magnitude of each of these terms. Uh, they're normalized in terms of the density of the fluid. Um, and so if you use the internal energy, specific, specific heat capacity of water, liquid water, the temperature, it's per unit uh, mass, 
and so we don't have the, the mass in here. It's 7.1 times 10 to 3 joules per kilogram per Kelvin, and we're dropping it 100 degrees centigrade. And so the amount of energy in the water is something like 4 times 10 to the 5 joules per kilogram. So that's a number. If you do the same calculation for the second term by dropping it uh, by the maximum you can from the hydrostat to atmospheric at some distance away, then the amount of energy from the pressure drop per unit mass of uh, this, this, this is, um, what am I doing here? Um, this is 10 uh, megapascals, right? 10 times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter squared. So this is 10 MPa divided by the unit weight uh, by the density of water, which is 10 to the 3 kilograms per cubic meter. And that turns out to be 10 to the 4 joules per kilogram. And so all I want to do is compare these two numbers. So you'll see that the amount of energy that's present in the water, even for, I would say, relatively modest temperature drop. Justin was saying that these places in uh, Belgium, which I think are being really cold crust, as being 140 degrees centigrade. Certainly the air temperature at the surface is 20 or 40. And so that is 100 degrees centigrade, even in those, in what I would say is a relatively cool environment. So this is quite conservative. Even this is 40 times more energy is locked up in the heat than is in the pressure. And so it's making the point only that the temperature is where all the, the energy lies within this. Okay, can you go uh, down a little bit? Relative performance PNG, okay, heat is re okay. So the second point there is saying exactly what I said. One is a 40th of the other. And so it's the heat what to after. And also, once you start producing the reservoir, uh, the injection, the, the, you'll recover at some pressure and you'll inject at some pressure, the pressure won't change. And so the pressure will stay constant within the reservoir. And so you're not generating any energy from the pressure change because it's not changing. So the only thing that is going to change is that you're covering heat. And so that's uh, the, the important point. And heat, of course, can be re regenerated. It can be regenerated by water flowing to the reservoir from the sides and also by conduction, although it's much slower, from magma underneath to, to reheat the reservoir. And so the first way that we can look at that and what we will do is we'll look at um, simple box models for flow. So if you take the blue stuff up to the top of your page, uh, if you would. Okay. Well, I know at least you're awake today, Andrew. <laughs> and I know four people here are kind of awake. Five, good me. Um, and so the one thing I didn't say, so to register yourself, so instead of me looking on Zoom to see if you've attended for 75 minutes or been online, go to uh, six scan likely apparently my phone is linked to my machine even though zoom doesn't work still linked. what does that say so go to um participation six colon one and just do the quiz the quiz is i attended today so so that do that if you're here as well i can do it before 1 30. And so I, I did that before I came across. So simple box models we can use to look at um, fluid transmissions in the, the system. So we talked about porosity last time. Uh, so think about the fact that we have a box. It's got closed boundaries on it. It happens to be full of sand. Um, we, can we have two independent uh, cursors going on? Uh, the trouble for you, Andrew, is if you're running this on your machine, you can't take notes unless you're doing if you're trying to do it. That's that's what I was thinking about. I'm trying to like write stuff down physically, but uh, it, yeah. oh well. you'll be okay. Don't worry. Um, so if we have a box that's full of sand, that's our reservoir. It has a particular volume, V through score is our convention. A volumetric flow rate, kilo, uh, meters cubed per second would be SI. And we have within this reservoir, what we'll call a total volume, V2. And we'll divide that total volume is if we could centrifuge it so that all the quartz, uh, all the solids would go into one part, we'd call that the volume of the solids. And, we, and above that, we'd have the volume of the voids. And so we talked about this uh, before. So 
the porosity, the term we've used before has been N, lowercase n. Uh, so you might remind yourself of this. I'm using phi because um, Grant and Bixley, which is where these notes are taken from, a book that's also online uh, in this class, you can grab if you want to uh, use this terminology. What we could do is we could split the porosity into part that's filled with water, liquid, and part that's filled with vapor. And we use that to define what we've called before saturation. We talked about saturation in the context of relative uh, permeability. And saturation is just the proportion of the void space that's filled with that phase divided by the total volume of the void space. So if it's 100% water filled, then the saturation of water is one, saturation of vapor is zero. If it's 50% water filled, saturation to water is 0.5, and the saturation to whatever the other fluid in the system is, vapor, is 0.5 as well. So you get the idea from that. So we can define in this very simple model, uh, we're not counting for any uh, X, Y, or Z uh, directions, a volumetric production rate, meters cubed per second. And also in um, Grant's book, they define a mass flow rate, which is just the product of volumetric flow rate times density of the fluid. If it's density of water, it's the density of water. If it's vapor that you're producing, uh, it's the density of vapor. And of course, the units of that would be kilograms per second. And it's convenient for us to use mass balance because we, we use masses to be balanced within our system. We can't create or destroy mass within our system. Can you roll down one screen? Okay. So thank you. So you'll recognize, so this is only mass balance. And so the equation at the top, you'll recognize, right? Uh, outside the bracket, outside this term is the total volume of the system. And the change in this could be inside here. V could be inside here, but it doesn't need to be. But all we're saying is that the change in mass within the system has to equal the amount that's drawn out of the system, which is Q times the density. So this is the amount that's supplied or withdrawn from the system. W is for withdrawn. I guess it's for. And the product of these volume porosity and density uh, will be the response to that. So you take out a kilogram of, uh, per second of mass, the part, the volume, the mass within the system must change by that rate exactly. That's all it's saying. These, all three of these could be in this bracket, but the volume of our reservoir on its outside isn't changing any. And so we can take V out. That leaves these other two parts in here. So what we can do with these other two parts is we could realize if you go to the figure above that the volume can, of the porosity can contain either uh, liquid, sorry, that there's, okay, that's fine. So this, uh, that's our mass balance. So I'm not gonna do anything about that. The other thing that we have to account for is heat balance within our system. If we produce lots of cold water, that doesn't buy us anything. And so we also can put a balance on heat. And so the energy balance on heat is the product of mass flow rate, kilograms per second, multiplied through by the enthalpy in the system, H. And so what the energy um, within our system is going to be the energy that exists in the porous medium. This would be the product of C times T, specific heat capacity times temperature of the quartz grains within our rock, times the density of the solid quartz, times one minus porosity. Because one minus porosity is the proportion of the reservoir, which is filled with quartz, right? So this term on the left in black is the proportion of the reservoir which is solid and it's not going to move. And the term on right is the proportion that is filled with water. So the porosity multiplied by one phase, density of water is going to be the most important part for us because it has the highest density and can carry the most heat. And it's um, internal energy, right? Which is 
specific heat capacity times delta T, basically, for both of these. This would be specific heat capacity of quartz times delta T, change in temperature. So what we can do if we go back to, so ignore the heat balance equation for now. Let's go back to the top equation, which is mass balance. Uh, well, no, <laughs> and go down a bit more. So uh, yes, yeah, sorry. So assuming isothermal depletion. So we'll assume that there's no temperature changes in our reservoir. So if we take the mass balance equation, and if we take the terms of density and porosity that both exist within the partial derivative with respect to time and we can split that into two components density times the change in porosity and porosity times the change in density we did it in 303 many times ad, in, ad nauseum i'm sure and so that's exactly what we're doing here we're pre-multiplying by the volume of the reservoir and uh, we're equating these changes within the reservoir with however much mass flow of water we're taking out of the reservoir. That's all that equation says. If we take this expression and we multiply top and bottom by uh, dp, so the red parts here we're just multiplying by one, the same equation, and rearranged, and the right hand side we're just multiplying by one, then what we can do is we can take this change in pressure with time term out, outside the brackets, and put it here, and if we do that, we have this equation below it. Uh, and uh, I guess all I've done is I've taken this density outside and multiplied by density over density, which is this term here. And we end up with a final equation. And this is kind of a mass balance equation for our um, lumped parameter system. And what it's really saying is that if we're producing water out of the system at some rate, then it has to come from the reservoir. If it comes from the reservoir, the consequence of producing that water out at that given rate is that the pressure in the reservoir drops. And we can say exactly how much that pressure will drop by this expression. It looks kind of complicated, but for sure you've seen the, this term on the right before. This is um, pressure. Yeah, this looks like phi, but it's actually P, isn't it, right? It's this P here. This is change in density with pressure divided by one over density. Or this is the compressibility of water, of the fluid in the reservoir, multiplied by the porosity. It only fills the pore space, so that's why one. So this is the amount of fluid that we'll produce out of the water. The pressure in the, in the fluid goes down. If the pressure in the fluid goes down, the fluid wants to expand, it becomes bigger. But it's living in the same space, so it has to be produced out of the reservoir. So that's, that's what's going on. The other part of the reservoir is that the reservoir will contract. The pressure is applied on the grains. If we remove the pressure from the grains, then the overburden weight of the lithostat compressing it uh, increases relatively. And it's that increase that makes the reservoir um, compact. So the term on the left is compaction of the reservoir. The term on the right is expansion of the fluid. They're both positive because they both produce fluid and they both contribute to match um, the change in water in the system. And W would be positive for a rate out of the system by sign convention. And so this term, uh, oh, that's not bad. That, ter that whole term and that partial in that derivative is compressibility. It's compressibility of water. So lowercase c is compressibility of water. And this term on the right, on the left rather, is the change in porosity with pressure. It's really the change, it's called the compressibility of the reservoir. Compressibility of the medium, c, c sub m, compressibility of the water. Okay, can we go down a bit? Thanks, oh, yeah, perfect. And so that's, just a way of being, that's the same equation as we had before, but now we've sub substituted for these partials, these actual uh, measurable characteristic terms, reservoir compressibility, fluid compressibility, and we can look at what those magnitudes are. Um, Bix, uh, Grant and Bixley define this term on the left-hand left side 
the volume of the reservoir multiplied by these two compressibilities as the specific volumetric storage of the reservoir, S sub V. Um, and uh, they contain these two parameters. So what you could do is if you divided this equation up here by S sub V, you'd get W over S sub V equals dp over dt. So in other words, dp dt, if you plotted at the position in the reservoir, how the pressure changes as a function of time, if you're producing fluids, it'll go down. And all this little diagram at the bottom is saying that if this, the pressure change with time will be very fast if the uh, numerator is big and the denominator is small. So if Q, the flow rate that you produce at is fast, rapid, or it's not a very compressible reservoir, then the flow, the uh, pressure drop in the reservoir will be fast. If the converse is true, if you're not producing it at any rate at all, it will be a horizontal line. And if you're producing it very slowly, or if the uh, storage in the system is relatively large, then this will be much more shallow. That's, that's all that people would say. And so what we can do is we can put some numbers on those individual compressibilities. Remember that compressibility is one over modulus. Modulus is a stiffness. And I always talk, I think in terms of modulus. A rock, the stiffness of a rock is something like 10 gigapascals. 10 times 10 to the nine Newton meters squared. So the compressibility is one over that. Uh, surprisingly, um, water, the modulus of water is about two gigapascals, almost the same as rock, even though you think you see it squeezes out in the side. Compressibility is an equal compaction in all directions that can't escape. So I guess that's what we have to, to do to make it this compressible. And so it's a fifth the modulus, and so it would be five times more compressible, but of the same order. And we also know from 303 that from the ideal gas law, the modulus of a gas up to pressures of, I think, about 70 megapascals is equal to the pressure. And so we're atmospheric pressure here. So the modulus of the air around us is equal to a bar, which is a tenth, 100, 100 kPa, a tenth of a megapascal. And so the steam that ex exists uh, won't always be that low pressure. But if you look at the compressibilities of these, we'll find out that the, um, the steam is very compressible, the water is not very compressible, and the uh, aquifer is even less compressible. OK, can we go down, please? Yeah. That's what I'm saying there. Yes, yeah. And you know, you can get the compressibility of steam. It's really just a, a gas with a bit of liquid in it. And so it, sh it should uh, conform to the gas law. Whether it's the ideal gas law or not, I don't know, but it depends on the circumstances. And that equation, change in pressure with time, is equal to the mass flow rate divided by S sub M, or the volumetric flow rate divided by S sub V, is just the way that they define these storage coefficients. S sub V is a storage with relate, uh, related to uh, volume. So it doesn't include the uh, density. And S sub M is just pre-multiplied through by density. So it's a storage with relation to, to mass. And it's probably mass that's going to be most useful to us. So S, M, S sub M is probably most useful to us. All right. Can you go down to definition of S sub V? Yeah, okay. So now we're coming up to 55 minutes, I guess. So I'm trying to think what I did now. I guess I've, I, I started comparing what those compressibilities mean in terms of the volumes that we will produce from a, a lumped uh, box reservoir. So if we take a box, which is a kilometer on edge, a thousand meters by a thousand meters by a thousand meters deep, uh, left hand side. Um, we think that we can change the pressure by the maximum by dropping it down to a thousand meters of water. 
So 1,000 meters of water is the DP that you see there, which is going to be of the order of 10 megapascals, as we said before. And so if you think about the mass of fluid that we produce, we can get the mass of fluid we produce just by multiplying S sub n, which is a storage coefficient times the change in pressure. And so that is exactly what is being done here. So the mass of fluid will be density times the volume of the reservoir times the compressibility. I know I use lowercase c as specific heat capacity, but c is the compressibility uh, in this particular case. I think. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, yeah. No, no, I was just thinking. I was trying to think. And so the density of water is, um, so this is for um, the change in volume of the reservoir. So it's a thousand kilograms per cubic meters for density of water. The volume of the reservoir is a kilometer cubed, which is 10 to the three on edge, 10 to the three, 10 to the three, 10 to the three, which is 10 to the nine cubic meters. Um, the compressibility, lowercase c, is 1 over 10. Actually, I've used 10 gig. Uh, um, oh, yes. I've, uh, no, the calculation's wrong. Of course, the compressibility of the reservoir, if that's what I'm doing, is going to be of the order of 10 gigapascals. So instead of being 10 to the 7, it should be 10 to the 10. Um, oh no, I, I guess it's not. It's bad. My handwriting is pretty bad. So that's a nine, right? Because I'm crossing out with the nine on top. And then the change in pressure is 10 megapascals, which is 10 to the seven pascals. And so I, I guess I've used for this uh, a gigapascal for the, uh, for the modulus of the reservoir. And so the amount of fluid that you'd produce from that by dropping the pressure by uh, 1,000 meters of water by, by 10 megapascals is 10 to the 10 kilograms. Okay. Doesn't mean anything to me. I have no idea how much that is. If you scroll down, we're going to make some comparisons with some other things. So that's coming out from the change in compressibility of the reservoir and the fluid within the reservoir. If you look at the total mass that's in a, a that reservoir in a swimming pool that is uh, a kilometer by kilometer by kilometer, it's going to be 10 to the 12. And so the amount that's coming out is a hundredth of that swimming pool. If we just said on the previous slide that it's 10 to the 10. To the 10. Um, and so it's only a small fraction of the total mass that would be in the swimming pool. If we look at the um, so we're only producing, say, a hundred of the total reservoir volume by, by dropping the pressure. If instead of dropping the pressure and squeezing fluid out of the pore space, we completely desaturate the pore space. So we change the pore space instead of being filled with water to being filled with nothing or steam because we vaporize all the water. Then we can calculate that by multiplying 10 to the 12 times the porosity. Prosody might be equal to 0.2, 20%. And if that's the case, well, it's, if it's equal to 10%, it would equal 10 to the 10, 11 kilograms. And so all that calculation is showing you is that if you completely dewater the pore space by changing the liquid into vapor, then uh, you get something like 10 to the 11 kilograms of water out of it. If you drop the pressure by a thousand meters of water, but don't desaturate it, then the, the amount you make is off the slide, but it was 10 to the 10 kilograms, so a tenth of that. And so the point being made is that the compressibility doesn't supply very much water. Okay, that, that's what the take on this. Can we go down some more? Next, next slide. Oh, geez. All right. All right. So, Let's get more sophisticated. So we can have our box reservoir. Um, so far, the box has been closed on the sides. But we think that if the reservoir is a kilometer by kilometer by kilometer, 
actually just as Justin showed uh, in his figures on Thursday, he showed some plan views of uh, the Rotokawa Reservoir with areas of reds and blues. Uh, the reds were the part of the reservoir that was being depleted where pressures were drawn down and water was being injected around it and was flowing into it. That in some respect is this box. So the reservoir we're depleting is the cubic box we have, so a kilometer by kilometer by kilometer. But the reality is that perhaps it isn't closed on its boundaries. And if it's not closed on its boundaries, then what would happen would it would start at pressure P0, horizontal pressure, pressures everywhere are the same. And as you draw down, as you remove fluid at some rate, uppercase W or Q, uh, volumetric rate Q or mass flow rate W from the box, then the pressure drops down within the reservoir. The pressure drops down within the reservoir, the pressure outside would be higher. And so Darcy's law would say that it would want to replenish the reservoir. And so the simplest model we can look at probably is one where we have a closed box that isn't closed, but allows resupply from the outside. And so if we do that, then the equations that we get would define two things. So scribbled, very bad handwriting, equation one is that the mass flow rate out of the system has to generate a pressure change, which is given by the storage of the reservoir. This is the compressibility, terms of the compressibility and the volume of the reservoir. So if we produce a lot of fluid, the pressure will go down a little because this is just a coefficient, constant coefficient. So that is one of the balance components we have. If we're removing stuff from it at this rate, then pressure is going to drop down, but we're going to supply water back to it. If the pressure is P0 in the reservoir, there's no gradient. So Darcy's law would say that we wouldn't supply anything to it because it's a function of dpdx, right? But if we make the assumption that as we draw down the pressure within the box, we'll reach some equilibrium and this external pressure P0 will stay the same. This pressure in the box will drop down controlled by how quickly we recover it and we'll reach some equilibrium. The equilibrium where we're in balance with the supply of fluid to the box from the outside is gonna equal the rate that we're removing. Mass balance, basically. And so if we roll, so what we can do is we can look at a difference between a recharge rate. So W sub R is a recharge rate. And of course, um, when the recharge rate balances the withdrawal rate, then nothing's happening within the system. So if we roll down the, or perhaps make it smaller so we can still see the boxes. Yeah, that's good. That's, yeah, great. So the conservation equation is the one you see there. That's mass balance. So the first term, um, is that the accumulation within the reservoir is given by the pressure change divided by time and the storage. And the term on the right hand side is mass balance between the amount that is withdrawn from the reservoir, uppercase W, versus the amount that recharges into the reservoir, which is driven by the spatial difference in pressure uh, from the outside to the inside. And those have to balance to be equal to zero. Um, w, I think, is positive if you're re removing fluid. Uh, pressure increases would be positive. Time into the future is positive. And storage is just a, a positive constant, a non-zero positive constant. Okay, roll down, please. So the best assumption, okay, right, press roll up. So you just got that equation, the diff up a little. Yep, great. So the easiest way to solve that is to, we have to make some assumption about the recharge rate. And the easiest way to define is if we define the recharge rate as being proportional to the difference between the external reservoir and the drawdown reservoir, right? So this term here, if the outside pressure and the inside pressure are the same, there is no recharge. If the outside inside pressure goes down relative to the static outside pressure, then we generate some recharge. 
if we double the pressure difference, we'll double the, the flow rate. Makes sense if, if for instance, height, um, permeability isn't changing. We know that Darcy's law says exactly that. You double the pressure difference between the upstream and downstream, you double the flow rate. And that's all that's saying. And so if we substitute this WR into here on the top, we end up with this expression, which is a, a partial differential equation. So I guess uh, in, in time only, not in space, we can prescribe how quickly we remove fluid. We have to figure out exactly what this proportionality constant is, and we have to be smart and figure that out. Um, we would know what the outside initial pressure of our reservoir would be. We'd probably like to know what the pressure would develop to being in our reservoir, the equilibrium pressure as it gets drawn down. This is a constant, and this is the same pressure as this. And so it's a, a first order, a zeroth order partial differential equation. First order in time, zeroth order in space. There's no X or Y's components. The solution to this is a very simple solution. If you roll down, the solution is exactly that equation that's given. Thanks. And it says that the difference in pressure that will develop is given by how fast you withdraw fluid from it divided by this coefficient, which would include things like the permeability, I guess, of the reservoir, and also some geometry dimensions of the reservoir. We haven't said anything about that yet. And this one minus the exponential of time, same alpha, and the storage. And so that's the solution to that equation above. And what that solution looks like in time is the graph below. And so it says that you're uh, the pressure of inside your reservoir starts off at P0. You start sucking water out at some rate W. It'll go down in time. It'll go down in time until um, this, term, this exponential balances out. And that occurs at a time of T times alpha divided by SM, which is roughly equal to 1. So in other words, when this term here is roughly equal to 1, um, this term is a maximum and stays a maximum, and that's the steady state value. And so there are only two interesting ordinates on this graph. One is that the time taken for it to draw down to its equilibrium behavior is this time here. And so if you know what alpha is, we need to figure that out. And if you know what the uh, storage of your reservoir is, physical property, which we can measure, then you can calculate how long that takes. And you can also calculate what the pressure drawdown will be because it'll be given by this amount here. The uh, recovery rate, mass recovery rate, how long it takes to get to this um, equilibrium time um, divided by the, the storage. Yeah, I think this T has to be the equilibrium time. Okay, well, I'm not, not quite sure, but well, good enough. But there are two important characteristics you can get out. How long it takes to get to steady state and what that steady state is in terms of pressure change. Can you scroll down a little bit? All right. All right. And so the use of that is that now uh, we didn't necessarily get it, but we, we can get from that if we know what the, the production rate is W. And if we make some assumptions about the temperatures and the specific heat capacity. So here, unfortunately, C is the specific heat capacity, not the compressibility of the system, times the temperature drop, we can calculate the energy recovery. And so um, if we wanted to explore some different rates, then we could calculate how long it would take before we reach this equilibrium and whether the um, the pressure drawdown that we have in the reservoir is acceptable to us. Um, we want it to be large enough that we can withdraw a decent amount of flow out of the system, but not so large that we'll pull a whole bunch of cold water into the system that will essentially kill our reservoir. So that's the, the problem that we've got to deal with. And the final part on the bottom of the page, I guess we have five minutes to go, and I've got to get to my, I've got to sprint across the Hammond building after this, is we haven't said anything about what alpha would be. And so what we could do um, 
is we could do two things. We could realize that this value of alpha is given by a mass flow rate divided by a pressure drop. We could realize that this mass flow rate is equal to the volumetric flow rate times the density of the fluid. So that's just another way of writing W. And what we could do is we could write this in terms of Darcy's law. So this is a volumetric flow rate. So Darcy's law says that density, which is the same one here, area times permeability times viscosity times change in pressure over length. So I can't do this very well, but the A times K divided by viscosity times DP over L is Darcy's law. So outline this term here. And of course, this P minus P zero minus P cancels with this um, pressure drop. And so this is saying that the value of alpha that we would define would really be equal, would it be a function of the permeability? It'd be a function of the viscosity, the fluid that's flowing, and it would somehow be a function of the geometry of the system. You'd have to choose a length um, of supply from the upstream pressure P0 to the drawdown pressure in the reservoir um, P. But we can get it somehow. So that's that's fine. We could also, uh, and a good example to do, would you could also think about this in terms of flow mix, right? You could think of this reservoir instead of being in plan view a um, uh, a square, but instead of being planned you a circle, <laughs> and all flows would be going towards that circle, and so you could draw a flow net that would give you the geometric um, flow rate that would go into that circle as a function of the flow nets that we drew. And all the flow nets have to be, would they be radially, um, radial flow lines? They would be equipotentials, which are perpendicular to those radial flow lines, kind of like a spider's web. And each of the squares would have to be a square, equal length and width as you go across it. And we could you could use that to calculate exactly what this geometric factor is better than using this kind of idealized flow along the core diagram. So that's